So last but not least, we are looking into a machine learning use case at Scout24. Um, this is really about like evolution of models and uh, lessons learned on the way. Um, so for vehicle and property price prediction at Scout24, please welcome to the stage Sebastian Boltz and Mike Götze. Hi. Let's hope technology works. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, it works. Um, we are here from Scout and want to tell you about um, our experience with um, data science. We don't really do lots of extensive research. Most data scientists will try to work extensively long on products and on, on algorithms and tune them um, to squeeze out every last bit of accuracy. We are more focused on trying to get um, an MVP and then a, a product out quite quickly and um, we usually do this within a few months, mostly three or so, and um, that includes building a product which is consumer facing in the end as well. And now we want to share with you some of our experience that we had in two lines of those products, mainly our valuation engines, property and vehicle valuation. And, um, before we go there, of course, some introduction as well. As you probably know Immobilien Scout and Autoscout, which are our m um, most prominent brand names. We also have a business unit which is tackling adjacent business like um, consumer services, which is called. And we are currently running in five core geographies and we reach roughly 80 million households. I'm pretty sure that that's not really the same size as Zalando is, but well, it's good as well. <laughs> Um, and as with most companies, we also have the mantra of mobile first and we, as a data science group, want to transform the company into an AI first company and we already have some kind of backing from the um, management and we don't want to do it the way that you feared most companies would want to do it, like um, you want to hire as much scientists as possible, mainly because it's not possible to hire so many uh, scientists and then it's... Um, too expensive, of course. So we um, want to try to transform the company from within and um, train and educate and um, help them make uh, make them understand what ML is capable of and um, how it can leverage um, our everyday works. The, um, the architecture, the, the team setup in itself is quite recent. Um, we. We have a data platform as well. Uh, we have a data lake and catalog and a meta store, so you all are familiar with those concepts. You are you're applying them yourselves. Then we have a um, two teams um, which are mostly about data as a reporting as a service kind of. So it's um, they are focused around the easy data access, and um, they provide support and some tooling in order to help um, all the company to get insights out of the data, mostly in retrospect. Whereas we have two other teams, the data science team and the data product engineering team who are working um, more to predict the future and build products powered by ML on top of the data from the data lake. And one of our well, the two main um, pillars for us in terms of strategy currently are personalization and user experience and market transparency. And market transparency itself is um, the validation engines that we are soon going to talk about. And you see we are rather small compared to the hundreds of scientists here at Zalando, but still six is a reasonable size. <laughs> and um, we have two concepts. We have a scientist in residence concept, which means that all our business units have um, a specific scientists. Well, not all, only some. But um, the scientists in residence are um, explicitly um, zuständig, verdammt, zuständig for <laughs> Responsible things for uh, for a specific business unit, and we call those business unit segments. And we have core scientists as well, and the core scientists are more like a generalist in terms of the um, domain knowledge, and they help out wherever help is needed. The data product engineering team consists currently of two engineers, and this is the new part from the slide before. We set this up kind of as a result of the learnings that we made with the recent products. And um, both teams are located in Munich and Berlin. Munich is the headquarters for Autoscout. Berlin is the headquarters for Immoscout. And 
even though we are small teams, uh, we it's still rough to do it cross-locationally, but still I think we managed quite well. And now I want to hand over to Mike to tell you about the experiences we had with the variations. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, yes, as Sebastian mentioned, uh, car and uh, real estate prediction is one of our core tasks in the data science team. And I will show you the journey we did with both uh, valuation engines. Um, let's start with the car price estimation. Um, the old or initial approach was um, yeah, train a random forest model in R with the data we had on our platform from the last two years. And the setup was, okay, data science team developed in R and then handed it over to a productionizing team, which was in charge to bring it to production. And one problem with that was, okay, the feedback loop was very long. So the, the model was developed in R, it was ready, it was good in terms of accuracy, and then the team who was in charge, uh, which was in charge for the productionizing, realized, okay, our models in production is not the best you can do. Um, and we used, uh, and the production system at Scout was running w basically on Java and Scala. And so we uh, used H2O to uh, create Java classes out of the, our created uh, models, or trained models. And we had a lot of them. Uh, we uh, created uh, roughly s over 10,000 models for all the countries we have uh, available for Autoscout and Autoscout and for each make model combination we had own model and then we had a light model and a full model which means okay light model was trained on a reduced set of parameters and the full model uh, was taking all the data we have about the uh, car and so we had a lot of things to do, and, and also the training cycle was right long uh, because translating all the R stuff to uh, H with H2O to Java classes was quite a long time. And um, also the ramp up time of the servers, if some server crashes or um, we want to update the models, was quite long. And one side effect was, okay, auto scout, uh, auto scaling was not available because the ramp up time of one of more than one hour is not feasible. Um, here you see one example. So here you see the database. Uh, we turned a model in R. Then you see, okay, for one uh, make model combination, the Volkswagen Golf, we have here a tree. It was, but it was a random forest. And so the next iteration was, okay, uh, which is currently in the rollout phase. Um, uh, replace R with Python and um, trained uh, XGBoost model on top of, uh, yeah, use the XGBoost model. And the result was okay, we have only one model for all the countries, for all the make model combinations, and um, it's much more feasible and uh, we have also a better accuracy, 30% in this case. And one thing we introduced as well was um, optimize the prediction time with tree light. So come, I will say some words in a few seconds about tree light. And so we could uh, decrease the prediction time from 2.4 milliseconds to 0 0.2 milliseconds. And also the, the memory consumption went down from one more than one gigabyte to uh, lower than two megabytes. Everything is Dockerized, so it's running in AWS and ECR, uh, in ECS, so it's auto scaling is available. And um, yeah, the model is much more stable and yeah, it's quite good. And one thing we also introduced, what uh, Sebastian also already mentioned, is that we worked very closely together, the data product engineering team and the data science team is working very close together, so we know all the uh, necessary things about productionizing the systems already, and the uh, data product engineers know what we are doing and uh, can give feedback very early. Um, 
some words about TreeLight. Um, yeah, basically we create a C file out of the uh, trees. We can train in, in Python, uh, like XGBoost, like GBM, or like Learn, and then um, use the TreeLight um, library in production and uh, load the uh, C compiled model file and the uh, inferences really, really quick. Um, some words about the real estate valuation. Um, yeah, our old approach, which was developed in 2010, it's quite old, but it's still running in production. And um, we have a lot of dependencies to legacy systems in, so like in-house, bar clusters, Oracle databases, and all the stuff we want to get rid of. And yeah, we did the same here. We had two departments, the data science developed something and then handed it over to a uh, production analyzing team. And yeah, the model is based on the linear regression in R, again, R. And, and on top of this, we use a K nearest neighbor search to find similar listings and do some calculation on top of it. Um, the real estate evaluation is only available in Germany, and so we have uh, 1,700 models available, and uh, the real estate evaluation is integrated in a lot of products at Scout. So, and we have adapted the models for some special cases like map solutions, real estate indexes, uh, light model, full models, and other stuff. Um, we also, the, the, the uh, linear regression is also based on a SCOW24 geo hierarchy. So we have federal states, cities, and districts within the city. And this, this changes over time, especially in East Germany. Um, so that leads to undesired behavior as well. And then we realized, OK, quite early that, yeah, we have some problems with real estate valuation with the current approach and developed in 2014 a new prototype um, with Python, based on Spy, Python with PySpark to train the models in parallel and um, with a bit of R. To, uh, so we used Kriging and um, yeah, then for some reasons, because the company had some structural changes, uh, we stopped the project, but in um, 2017, end of 2017, we started again with a prototype, with a prototype, and tried to productionize the systems. Okay, one thing we removed already was uh, the R dependency. We replaced it with a Gaussian process, and um, moved everything into AWS. Um, by replacing a uh, Kriging with a uh, Gaussian process, uh, um, we can only train the model with. Uh, with low amount of samples because then it's not feasible to compute uh, the model anymore and to train a model anymore. So we split it the whole country into smaller areas. So in the end, we had more than 100,000 models for the whole country. Um, the accuracy in average was much better than the old legacy model, but in, on average, um, and we tested it in, on some test areas, and the performance and the behavior of the model was quite good. But then we realized, okay, the average is good, but if we, when we rolled out the model to the whole country, we realized, okay, there are some key areas where the model is really, really unstable, and also the hyperparameters hyper uh, we found was grid search or Bayesian grid search, uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, were really, really unstable. And um, it was more or less random. And also the performance, the predicted values were, were crap. And then we brainstormed again, found some improvements. The model gets got more and more complex. And at some point, we said, OK, uh, let's say, Let's try something different. And here we use the same approach for Auto Scout as we did for Auto Scout. And uh, the only thing we did uh, was replacing XGBoost by LightGBM. We used the same uh, optimization with 3Light. And 
the result was, yeah, we have only one model um, for houses and apartments. Um, we have better training, uh, uh, shorter training cycles. Uh, the prediction time was, was much, much faster than with a Gaussian process. And the accuracy was also much, much better than with the legacy approach and the Gaussian process model. Um, yeah, we can, we could use uh, almost the same training code, the tree light optimization, the prediction infrastructure, prediction infrastructure, and yeah, and also one nice benefit was uh, the cost went down dramatically because uh, the training was much more efficient and the prediction also. Um, yeah, that's all from my side. Don't worry, only two more slides. <laughs> Okay, now our learnings, um, we split this into don'ts and do's. I want to start with the don'ts. Um, we learned for ourselves that we should never stick blindly to what worked in the past. I mean, um, the old approach, or the, the prototype approach that wor um, worked uh, at the pro prototype level was fine. The legacy approach worked for quite a while, but we, we tried to stick to the regression approach and um, it took us quite a while to realize that the regression approach is just not feasible for state-of-the-art real estate valuation. And um, next don't is we will never want to hand over our models to really a very distant department for productionizing. We want to keep in the loop. We want to stay in the loop. We want to actually um, be much more involved in that and um, see it as more of our own responsibility than someone else's. And we don't want to strictly follow approaches from research. For example, the regression approach was something that we, for quite a while, it has not been done differently in research, um, be it from the United States, UK, or wherever. And only recently, and coincidentally, we found out after we switched um, that um, we there was kind of a similar approach with um, a tree-based approach that um, was ranked quite high in the Kegel competition with uh, Zillow. And, um, but before that, we always try to stick to the approach that has been done and recommended in research itself. So we should be more open and have our own opinion and test our own ideas. Then we, another don't is, we will never believe that a single scientist can know it all. It's really a group effort and every single scientist, however clever and smart they are and however how, how big they are in terms of genius they are really just a single person and the group is always coming up with ideas that a single person cannot come up with and um, the idea to change the approach from well let's try out the auto scout approach is something that was different scientists who was not working on the project came up with it just in a deep dive session where the team was brainstorming around and going deeper into projects and so on and this was really very very valuable and helped us quite a bunch and um, which leads me to the next point. We were kind of binning roughly six months worth of work at that point in time. And we still managed to meet our um, deadline and to almost, but uh, we, we, we managed to get almost done with all the stuff within the, the remaining three months, although we changed completely. And um, this also um, is encouraging um, as much as it is kind of paradox. I mean, of course, don't, no one wants to throw away some work and want to admit that they, are wa they have wasted time and company resources. On the other side, it's much worse to stick to the approach and f um, fall prone to the um, sunk cost fallacy there, rather than um, just make a stop, go from there and um, do the right thing from then on. And this really helped us quite a lot. And the do's on the other side, well, always challenge yourself, always think th and Challenge others, of course. Brainstorm with your peers. Discuss how um, how you are approaching things. Are op you need to be open to ideas of the others. You actually need to ask them to um, come up with ideas because especially scientists are very weird lot, I would say. Usually they don't really, well, from my experience, they don't really like to be questioned. They are the clever guys. They are the ones who question others. And um, then we want to care about the production deployment ourselves. That's something that um, I already mentioned. And now we want to try out things that work now, even if there is no research about them. So we don't want to follow the research blindly. And we want to test out things in production as early as possible. So the uh, prototypical prototype approach that we mentioned for the real estate valuation, well, 
we didn't try it out in production. We didn't really try it out uh, to roll it out to the to whole of Germany, and we might have found out sooner, maybe even during the prototype phase or whatever, that it's not a feasible approach, and it could have saved us some time and pain in the end. And that's it, and I'm sorry that we are three minutes over time. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, we are hiring. <laughs> <laughs> I think even though we are over time, we have still time for some questions. So. It's Duke from Zalando. A great presentation and very cool to see the bold moves and the savings you made. Um, yes. I wonder if you uh, predict a uh, value KPI using an ensemble approach like, um, um, like trees, whether it would reproduce uh, the tails of the distribution uh, well, so if you have extreme values, like in your case, I guess property extremely cheap or extremely exp expensive, averaging over many models, would it, I mean, the statistic, the overall statistic might be good, but would it reproduce the original distribution? I have done different value KPIs in the past, like customer values, and there the model overall was good, but it wasn't good on extreme cases, and then other models like neural networks were maybe better than this. So I wonder if you have the same problem or... Uh, we tested the models. We, we have some kind of ground truth. Um, so we have connections to some external partners which uh, collect the real estate prices uh, and um, we could test it. And yeah, we have exactly the same issue as you had. Um, so some points were not predictable. And yeah, the distribution was not the same, obviously, in some areas. I think the, the advice would be, I mean, might not work for you data, but is maybe look at neural networks, other models that are not ensemble based, because they tend to be great overall, but then they're not, they're not bold, as bold as you are in your development approach. The models are not that bold in predicting because they average out, kind of, but it might not work in your data, of course. I think that um, how much you invest into solving this issue is also a thing of, um, Efficiency and the business case itself. I mean, if the, that's what why we try to get out with something production ready as soon as possible. We want to see when we can stop. We don't want to tune to the extreme. I know that it's very um, sexy to do so, and I know that it's very enlightening to reach this state. But we also, well, we are very um, well. We are a small team. We have lots of work to do, and we we really want to be as efficient as possible about that. That means that if the model in the current state is already good enough to satisfy the business need there and to give our consumers the market transparency, then we are willing to be blamed for a few predictions that are off. So uh, basically, we work uh, with OKRs in our company, and the the goal in terms of accuracy was set before. And when we would achieve the goal, we would stop tuning the model. Uh, so I wanted to ask regarding the increase of number of models in the intermediate step. So what made you believe that increasing I think like 50 times the number of models that you will uh, have uh, will improve. And what was one model is predicting? So is it one like a city or uh, a square kilometer? Uh, sorry, a square kilometer of Germany. Ah, squ square kilometer. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what uh, what reasoning was to basically cut this uh, and go with one model that will basically uh, cover the whole country? Um, I'll try to answer it, and you can correct me if I do say anything wrong, okay? <laughs> I want it. Um, thing is that we increased because we applied this Kriging approach, and this is very um, CPU and memory intensive, which means that we can do it only on a very small data set. And we, at the same time, we try to parallelize the training. So we split Germany into more than 100,000 square kilometer grid cells, and we um, collected um, for each center we collected the um, nearest the nearest uh, listings, real estate listings, and um, then we train a model on those. And um, the idea behind that was to have a roughly the, the, well, location is key. 
that's the main reason for um, doing any location-based um, um, valuation in real estate. Location is, that's the mantra of every real estate agent. Location, location, location. And um, you see that in all the listing prices as well, which is why we, we um, had to take this into account somehow. Going from there to this one model approach was roughly a, a bold move by one of our scientists to say, okay, let's try to see if we can use location as a feature itself and not just um, as a model selection criteria. And um, in the end, it worked out quite well. We, but this was kind of a new era, area for us, or the, 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 it, it was not really sure or certain at that point in time that it would work because for vehicles, location is far less important. It's not even part of the model. It's not a feature for the model anyway. And um, here we have it, and, it's, and um, the, the problem with the 100,000 regions was that we have lots of areas in Germany which are so rural that you don't have enough listings in there. So when this made it quite unstable. In Berlin, for example, you easily get tens of thousands of listings per square kilometer. But in Sachsen-Anhalt, for example, you get probably three if you're lucky. Thank you. At first, I support your decision to use tree-based approaches. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> For this task, uh, they work uh, good enough, and they are awesome. And uh, I support your decision to use uh, one model, because uh, splitting it to several models is uh, like a, a high-level model. And um, when you have one, one other, it's a kind of synergetic effect. So they can learn from each other. Uh, and uh, I have a question. Um, you have too much categorical features, right? Say that again, please. Uh, you have too much categorical features. I still didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, categorical features, uh, for example, um, mm, apartment type, uh, so okay. uh, number of... Uh, uh, features, yeah, okay, yeah, yes. Categorical. <laughs> And uh, uh, did you try to uh, use uh, something like CutBoost, which is uh, a new uh, tool? Uh, for the Autoscout model, uh, we tried CutBoost, mm -hmm. but the performance was worse than with LightGBM and XGBoost. Okay. In our case. Because uh, I have uh, several cases when uh, I didn't use uh, hand feature generation and cut boost was better. So thank you. Yeah. One last chance to catch this awesome box. Okay, then thanks again, Sebastian and Mike. Thank you.